thank you guys for, for coming tonight. Um, I appreciate that you want to uh, be safe out there, that you want to know as much as uh, you can about what to expect and, um, and how to um, uh, do what you need to do to get through it safely uh, and wisely. Now, tonight, we're going to be talking about Pacific Crest Trail start dates in April. Uh, this will also coincide for those listening to uh, John Muir Trail starts in, um, uh, you know, uh, June, more or less. So if anyone's listening uh, for, with that in mind, uh, this is appropriate for you. I am going to um, first add a little bit to the administrative side, then dive into this thing. Uh, a March start, when we talked about March start dates uh, a couple weeks ago, that was really easy. I mean, March is simple to talk about. Um, April is very what I call problematic timing, because depending upon whether you start in the middle, the beginning of April, the end of April, there's the conditions in the Sierra and the conditions in the state at, at trail elevation are changing very rapidly especially during the time of the thaw, when the thaw starts roughly about the end of May. So um, when you start in April is a factor. So we're going to break it all down. We're, I'm going to be repetitive because I want to make sure you understand uh, what, we're, what, what I'm trying to present. Now, when we talk about uh, the pros and cons, we'll be at the end of sort of uh, my whole presentation because there's a lot of material to cover, to explain, what I'm talking about in the pros and cons. So first of all, I want to add a couple of things that are relevant uh, to, to who I am and what I've done. Uh, Carol said uh, you know, a few things, but let me just kind of build the picture a little bit. Um, when I was 14 or so uh, in 19, eh, what the hell was it, 70, <laughs> I heard about Eric Ryback and, and how he uh, hiked the trail and all that sort of stuff. And that got me very interested. And so I started planning the trip for 1974. Um, when I did the hike, I had an experience on Mount San Jacinto where uh, five people were uh, lost on a couple feet of snow, and this would be the uh, you know early part of no, it wouldn't be, be the third week of March in 1974, and they thought they were going to die, and they were huddled out in this uh, middle of this meadow and uh, freezing to death. When I heard their voices from my tent, I had just finished uh, cooking. Uh, cooking dinner and uh, went out there and they didn't know how to find their way back down to, um, to Idlewild. So I pointed them in the right direction. And then as, my, as I came back to my tent, I realized this is too beautiful an area and an incredible an experience to have anybody die or think they're going to die in it. So I thought of uh, the whole mountain education wilderness school thing. So when I went to when I went to college, I took all kinds of courses to kind of be able to uh, teach you guys about, you know, atmospheric sciences and what storms do and geology, all that sort of stuff. After that, I uh, got involved with the U.S. Forest Service as a wilderness ranger for Sierra National Forest, not far from uh, Muir Trail Ranch, and then um, went on to be a paramedic for a number of years uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, continued on into ski patrol work off and on, and um, building custom homes for 25 years, you know, outdoor industry doesn't pay anything just to stay alive. So, um, and then search and rescue in Tahoe for uh, for five years, working two different counties, one on the the uh, Nevada side, one on the California side, and and getting a little bit involved with the MRA, which is Mountain Rescue uh, Association, which is really great. But anyway, I wanted to kind of build that out so that you know that I'm not just a 74 through hiker, did the Continental Divide in 1980, got as far as Carroll did, which is Steamboat Springs, ran out of time. So I bailed out and I haven't, I haven't finished the second half of that thing. So uh, with that said, let's get back into this. I just wanted to, oh, and, and I, you know what? Four years ago, when hurricanes uh, Harvey, Irma, and Maria hit uh, Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico, um, the, the, because I had been a medic and, and search and rescue is simply called and I, I dropped mountain education and I kind of put it on the back burner and uh, started working for um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency or, or FEMA and I've been everywhere since but uh, it would appear that the demand is back for for what mountain education uh, tries to teach and that is to give you the skills and knowledge to stay safe out there long enough so that uh, you really let the, the wilderness build in you and it becomes a part of you. That's why people end the trail 
totally different than they started. So uh, that said, anyway, so the, the start within April is problematic for its timing because one, the preceding winter could be anything. And we've already covered this a little bit, but you can have a drought winter, a normal winter, whatever the hell that is, and a heavy winter. And so the, the more snow in the, in the Sierra, the um, longer will the, be the thaw, the amount of time it takes for all of that snow to melt off, and that's going to create complications. Um, I'll get into that in detail. Um, and also, because you're starting a month later than the March starters, you're going to kind of be cutting your hikes a little, just a little bit short in the sense that you've got to keep an eye on your only bookend of an entire Pacific Crest Trail through hike, which is when the powder snow starts flying up north in the North Cascades. Now, according to the rangers at uh, Manning Provincial Park in Canada, they say get off the trail by mid-September. That's when the snows start flying. And you know how the winters go, maybe a drought winter or the winter will start late up there. Maybe you can hike to October, maybe into October before you get buried. Maybe not, you don't know. So yeah, the rule of thumb is aim for the middle of September to be done with the trail because the last thing you want, and it's extremely frustrating, is to be that close to tasting your victory, your, uh, your Monument 78 experience and you can't go any further because it's dumping snow and it's just too dangerous out there. So uh, try not to push into uh, October 1st. So try and get it done uh, within that time frame. This, these things will affect two areas and that, that's how I'm gonna break down pros and cons. But the two areas are your strategy for your hike and the environmental issues going on during your hike that you need to be aware of, and that's why you're listening tonight. So the next section I'm going to cover is what I call the stuff you need to know. I have a very fond, uh, I like to use the word stuff a lot, so if you hear a few more times, don't be surprised. If you start April 1st, all the better. You're going to have about a six-week travel time to Kennedy Meadow South, so we're looking at a mid-May Sierra entry. At that point, if the thaw starts the end of May, that will give you two weeks of what I call the secret season, where the snow is still frozen. You know, it's still freezing at night. Temperatures can be 15 degrees, more or less, overnight. So the snow is nice and hard for walking on all day with no fear of post no sun cups, no raging creeks. Secret season is really great, but you're kind of catching the tail end of it, even if you start April 1st. If you start, say, April 15th, you're going to have about a June 1st entry into the Sierra, and that will be right about when the thaw starts. Now, that's not too bad. You've got about a week, you know, where this is theory. So if the thaw starts right around June 1st, it's really not going to ramp up in as far as the creeks will start rising and, and it gets to be post holy out there and it's you're wallowing in the snow and you got you can't go anywhere after 10 in the morning. It's not going to get that way for about five days, maybe a week after the thaw starts. The thaw starts when, and this is something you might want to consider monitoring when you're on the trail, the overnight temperatures are no longer below 32 degrees or freezing. So I'll carry a low reading thermometer that records, made by Kestrel. It also has a little uh, anemometer for wind speeds. Too bad. Oh, I bet I have one. Um, and that way I can notice that in the ramp up to the thaw's start, I can get an idea, maybe 10 days away, Oh man, it's, uh, it's 28 degrees one night, it's 30 degrees a few nights later, it's 32, it's pushing the envelope. When I see that happening, I know I've only got so many weeks left of hard snow to walk on. Oh, I bet I don't. Sorry guys, I'm gonna just, I like to show you stuff tonight. I didn't really get into the showing and documenting and the, what do we call it in elementary school? Show and tell. Uh, I don't know if I have, oh, I bet it's in my other path. Anyway. Um, 
no sweat. But it's, they're made by Kestrel. They're great little deals uh, for, for uh, measuring wind speeds and recording temperatures and all kinds of barometric pressures and barometers and all kinds of stuff. You don't have to get the fanciest one. Something about 100 bucks right in there. Um, OK, so that's when the thaw starts. So if you're starting April 15th, you're looking at really entering the Sierra in the, in the thaw, in the very beginning of the thaw. If you start the end of April, which I'm gonna highlight as being the, the, the famous date when everybody used to start because that's when the kickoff was, way back when. It wasn't that long ago, but I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, the ideal supposed start was the last weekend of April. That would coincide with what was called Ray Day uh, after Ray Jardine, which is a Sierra entry date of June 15th. The whole idea and premise of that was to enable you to uh, have a snow free or as snow free as possible a hike uh, as, you can, as you can get. Um, the problem would be uh, you know, on the pros and cons side is that you got to hike a little faster because, you know, mid September isn't that far away. So, the only other problem with entering the Sierra mid, mid uh, June that I don't know if Jardine covered, I never read his stuff, but um, these creeks are flying, high volume, high velocity, not safe. And that's what's killed a few through hikers in the past. So really entering mid June, mm, especially after a normal or heavy winter, not a good idea. If you have a drought winter, see this is, these are why I've had to preface the pros and cons to explain this because if you have a drought winter, the thaw might start the middle of, no, the 1st of May instead of the 1st of June. So you could go in the 1st of May and it's gonna look like July. After a drought winter, there's not much snow on the ground. And I'll get into the details of what the snow does. But if you really got to, as you're, as you're hiking north from, from Campo, pay attention to how many more snowstorms are burying the Sierra, if any. You never know. And you can get snowstorms that add up to two or three feet, even into June. Remember, these are high mountains close to a huge ocean. So therefore, there's a hell of a maritime current of moisture rising up out of the Central Valley of California and getting squeegeed by the Sierra. So all the moisture just dumps there. All it has to do is be cold enough and you're gonna get plenty of snow. So as you're going north, monitor how much snow the, the Sierra is getting, and then you'll know exactly what you're gonna walk into. If it's been a drought winter, you've got it made. If it's a normal winter, um, then you know the thaw will start about the end of May 1st of June. If it's a heavy winter, the thaw might not start right about then, but usually it does even after a heavy winter. All it's gonna mean is you're gonna have a prolonged thaw and you're gonna have really nasty creeks for quite a while. And I'll get into all that in a little bit. All right, let's get into the timing thing. I just, just a generalized picture. If you're leaving April 1st, so we're looking at six weeks to, to Kennedy Meadows South. Um, so when you enter the Sierra, it's going to be about mid-May, like I said before. So here's a little bit of this redundancy. Um, you go through the Sierra at, on snow at one mile an hour. Don't try and push it because if you push it, then your slip and falls will start increasing in number. Um, a lot of times you say, okay, well, heck, I'm just going to hike in my, my crampons or whatever. When the surface of the snow starts to melt during the day, and this will happen when the temperatures rise up about 40 degrees or so, and that'll be what you're going to have during the day in May after a normal winter. The surface of the snow will start to melt, and by the end of the day, you're going to have two or three inches of this wet, soupy stuff on top of a frozen snowpack which isn't bad, but if you're wearing your crampons, they have a tendency to, uh, uh, the snow, the soft snow tends to clump up inside of the teeth. So what you end up with is this, is this half a, half a, a grapefruit <laughs> is really kind of what it is. It is this, the snow piles up in the teeth of your, your hiking crampons um, and you end up walking on a, a cantaloupe and it's a kind of a bear. So that, those are the surface snow conditions that you're going to have uh, with a mid-May entry into the Sierra. So what are you going to have when you get out of the Sierra? I basically consider uh, leaving the Sierra at Donner Summit, where you, the trail begins to drop down to Sierra City and cruises um, 
through Northern California at a much lower altitude than you were averaging uh, through the High Sierra, which I kind of look at at about 11,200 feet till you get to Sonora Pass. And then you're following ridges uh, up to Tahoe, but they're lower in elevation, maybe 10 at the very top uh, in volcanic in nature. And um, so from Sierra City on, you're at a lower elevation. Don't get deceived by thinking, okay, man, I hear at Kennedy Meadow South on the porch between hamburgers that everybody's saying there's a hell of a lot of snow in this year. And I'm just going to say, screw this. And I'm going to flip and go to Northern California. Matter of fact, why don't we just start at Donner Summit and continue on, you know, at Reno, Highway 80, Donner Summit, piece of cake and get there. Somebody can drop you off or whatever. Um, and that's what a lot of people do, but they don't realize the hazard. Uh, involved in that, and might as well cover it right now since I, I tend to get on tangents, and, but they're, they're valuable. You're in trees, and that's a big problem. You'll be in trees from Sonora, maybe northern Yosemite on. To be on snow and in trees is not good because if you're on a steep ridge, uh, of, of which the, the Pacific Crest Trail follows a lot of them, <laughs> um, it is called a crest trail. If you fall on the snow in the forest, you're gonna to come to a pretty quick end at the nearest tree. Now, even if it's a, the length of a car away from where you fell, as, as did happen to a student of mine, walking directly behind me, standing in my footprints on a steep traverse up north of Hart's Pass one mid-June many years ago, because he was heavier than I, he post hold in my footstep, lost his balance. Where does your head go when, when you're on a, a steep traverse? As soon as you lose your balance, your head goes with gravity. So he falls head first down the hill. The length of a car strikes a couple different trees, avulses his scalp, peels it back, and breaks three ribs. It can happen in no time at all. He had no time to self-arrest. Plus, the snow is too soft. And that brings up another point, but we'll talk about it tomorrow when we talk about safety solutions and self-arresting. Let's get back to your early April starts. So you're gonna go through Northern California about um, mid-June to mid-July. Takes about a month, depending upon your speed and how much snow. The snow will slow you down. Of course, creek crossings slow you down, but there aren't many of them up there. The conditions are gonna be warm, but they're not gonna be hot like they're gonna be a month later. Oregon's gonna be pretty Snowy because you're going to be there mid-July at earliest. Mid-July, you may be on two feet of snow at trail elevation for a good part of the, of the trail. So have that in mind, especially after a normal heavy winter. Washington is going to have pretty much the same. Even if you're there mid-August to mid-September, I had snow all the way to the last week of August after a normal winter. But that's my one experience. So I encourage all of you to when you're researching this thing, talk to people who have been out on the trail more than once. Um, I've, been on, I've been in the Sierra for 40 years. I've been teaching in it. So I've got a pretty good idea what a drought winter looks like, what a normal winter looks like, what a heavy winter looks like, and what's typical for the Sierra from Donner South to Kennedy Meadows uh, South. Although I have done some teaching, as I said, on Hearts Pass and around the sisters outside of Bend, Oregon. Um, I, I haven't been there often enough to tell you what it looks like each month after a drought, normal or heavy winter. So I'm not gonna go into that. That's your early month starts. So say starting April 1st. Now, if you start April 15th, it's gonna put you in the Sierra six weeks later. So you're gonna hit there around June 1st, like I said before. After a normal winter, that's gonna be the start of the thaw. You can already tell where I'm going with a lot of this. We're referring to, uh, environmental conditions and environmental landmarks like the thaw, which aren't typically talked about by anybody, unless you've lived up there long enough to realize, oh crap, this, this does happen and it changes everything. So uh, kind of make a mental note that that's something that really matters. When does the thaw start? How much snow is it gonna be working on melting? How long will that take? Um, and that sort of thing. So. Your mid-April starts are gonna stick you right into the beginning of the thaw. So it's not good in as far as the fact that it's gonna cause soupy snow 
uh, sun cups to develop that, that, that sink into the snow. Looks like a honeycomb pattern in the snow. And they start out as these cute little cups, like half of a softball. And they're very innocent looking and you don't think anything twice. You kind of wonder why they're there. And then after about a week or so, you'll notice that there are maybe the depth of uh, a mixing bowl, a big one. And then after a couple of weeks after the thaw has started, these things are starting to look like they're um, uh, garbage cans, you know, in, you know, garbage cans in the snow. And then after a while, they look like you're, you're full on uh, uh, waste management, uh, uh, recycling uh, garbage can that you wheel out to the street when it's collected. You know, they get, they get deep. And they're very awkward to step in and out of, and you can still post hole in them. And they're, the ridges between them are very hard to balance on, and it gets to be a mess. So sun cups aren't a good thing. Post holing you already know about, but here's the deal with that. If you're in the Sierra after a normal or a heavy winter, meaning the snowpack is thicker, when you get to post holing, that means you'll post hole farther or usually to where your legs come together and you know your groin stops you and, and you don't get any further. So you just wallow, which means you have to jettison your pack. You've got to lay out on the snow and see if you can pull your feet out, which is a pain in the, the neck because a lot of times when you post hole, if you haven't heard this yet, it's not a gentle experience. Not only is it a sudden unexpected thing that happens where you drop maybe a foot, two or three feet, depending upon the snowpack, as I just mentioned, um, and how much is remaining by the time you get there. But in the snowpack, realize every time a storm in the winter comes through, it drops another layer. Usually between layers, the sun has come out and frozen the snow. So the, your snowpack is a stratification of, of layers with ice layers in there. Also, should there be a wind event, you may have tree branches, you may have pine cones, you may have all, all manner of stuff stuck in the snowpack at different levels. Also, rock falls happen. You may have little boulders that skittered across the, the snowpack sometime during the winter. Avalanches dump chunks, huge chunks of snow and ice on the surface of the snow as they blow along, as they descend down into the, into the creeks and whatnot. And then when new snowfall comes, those chunks of ice get buried. So when you post hole in the spring, a lot of this ice in the snowpack is still ice. So when you are wearing your shorts and your legs are bare and you pull stool down through, you may come, you may extricate your leg and find out you're lacerated all over the place. Plus the boulders and the branches and the whatevers that are in there are gonna cut up your legs too. So therefore this is why you want tall gaiters. Anyway, I'm carrying on a bit, but let me get back to the point here. So uh, in the Sierra, you're going to be going through the, the thaw, and we'll get into what all that means. It's not just it's not just sun cups. It's not just raging creeks. It's not just post oiling to where you get fed up and you quit for the day. There's other things, and we'll get to those. Oregon's you're going to be in Oregon. You're going to be in Northern California. This is terrible because you're going to be in Northern California in July. That's when it's really hot. Uh, Hat Creek Rim, Old Station, Bernie Falls area they can get stupid exposed. In other words, when I say, when I use the word exposed, I mean, there's no trees. You're out there in the blaring sun like Southern California, very exposed. So uh, it's not a good time to be in that vicinity. So that's, I'm talking Northern California, July 1st to August 1st. Oregon isn't so bad. A lot of the snow is melted off by August 1st. So you'll have pretty clear sailing even after a heavy winter. And, and I got to add, Oregon and Washington right now have been receiving a very heavy winter. So, uh, and that's caused because outside of our wonderful December we had, and I'm in Southern California right now, California got hit a lot, as we all know, record snowfall in December, because the snowstorms weren't just going from west to east, they were coming into Seattle, Portland area, and then turning south and running all the way down the California coast. Therefore, even Southern California got about 18 inches. Well, there's still 18 inches on Mount San Jacinto. If you go to their uh, live camera uh, up on the top of the tram, um, you can see for yourself that the snow has covered the picnic table um, all the way up to the bench where you sit. So I guess, you know, 16, 18 inches uh, still remains uh, down here uh, at this point. Anyway, I digress again. 
Let me get back to Washington. Washington's problem will be, if you started mid-April, Washington's problem is gonna be the fact that you're pushing, you could be pushing into late September, August or October 1st ending. That's not good as far as snowstorms. Uh, I suggest you have some way to monitor what kind of storm events are coming when you get to Snoqualmie Pass and North. You don't wanna be caught out there like happened to 30, 40 PCT hikers, uh, 2016, I wanna say, when everybody got buried by like 12 feet of snow. Um, also realize that when the people mention how much snowfall just happened, they're, they're measuring the new flakes of snow. They're not measuring the stuff that you see if you walk out the door the following day after the snow has shrunk melted, consolidated, packed down, and you see maybe half of the 12 feet. But nevertheless, six feet of mush is not anything you're gonna go through. Okay, moving on. If you start the end of April, so everything is timing dependent. If you start the end of April, say when the kickoff was, so this is like the idealistic uh, timing for those who wanna travel light, that was the whole idea behind what Jardine began, which is the whole ultralight uh, movement, if you want to call it that, trend, fad, fashion, whatever. Um, you're going to enter the Sierra. First of all, you're going to go through Southern California when it's really hot. Anytime after, say, kickoff, which is the last weekend or was the last weekend of April, we've had, I was down there teaching the mountain safety uh, presentation, I don't know, from 06 to... 12 or something like that. I was down there um, teaching that. And during that time, we had everything from some snowstorms uh, the last weekend of April to heavy rainstorms to just getting baked alive with just really hot desert heat. Southern California is largely high desert. It doesn't mean it's like sand dunes and all of that. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about sagebrush and, and uh, uh, lots of soil with lots of lots of distance between creeks and not a whole lot of shade pinion pines that aren't very tall um, until you go up in elevation say to above 6,000 feet or above 5,000 feet where you're going to start getting taller pines that you can take shelter under and get out of the sun also let me add to get out of the sun people have used uh, umbrellas unfortunately um, southern california gets a lot of high wind that's why you're going to see a lot of wind turbines down here. So uh, they don't, uh, little umbrellas don't survive very well for portable shade. So think twice about that one. Uh, back to uh, end of the month starts from Southern California from the Mexican border, the last weekend roughly of April. This is going to put you, like I said, through Southern California when it's really hot. Also, it's going to make you very dependent upon uh, Trail Angel water which may or may not be there. Uh, it's gonna put you uh, at Kennedy Meadows South about mid-June, once again, Ray, Ray Day. Um, so you're going to be going through the Sierra right in the, the whole length of the thaw. And I'll get to, in a second, I'm gonna get to how, how the thaw translates to how much, how many weeks are you gonna have of nasty creek crossings before things settle down? And I'll get to that in a minute. Now. That's the total picture. If you start at this date, you're gonna enter the Sierra about this date. These are the conditions you're gonna have in the Sierra, Northern California, Oregon and Washington. Let's get into the Sierra environment just itself because that is your really biggest adversary, I don't wanna say, that's gonna be your biggest uh, problem. All right. It's mainly gonna be talking about what we're talking about in general, is a ton of soft snow everywhere because it's thawing out, it's melting, causing a lot of water to be in the creeks and nasty creek crossings. Like I said earlier, let's just hypothetically talk a lot about the nor after a normal winter. So after a normal winter, the thaw is gonna start about the end of May. After a normal winter, uh, the thaws last about six or eight weeks to get everything melted out to where the creeks start coming down in volume and speed. Remember, water is very dense. The faster it moves, the more it's gonna push against you. Imagine someone hitting you with, oh no, but the best one, I was gonna say a fire hose, but people can't relate to that because not too many of us have been hit by a fire hose. 
unless you work for a fire department and you were out horsing around hauling hose one day. Um, some of us have uh, stood in the, uh, on the beach and had waves hit us, like waves of uh, mid thigh, maybe not waist, that's too high. Uh, say mid thigh, hip uh, depth. When those things hit you because water is so dense, it has no problem knocking you over and spinning you around. And the same thing will happen with creeks. So you really don't want to be doing creek crossings when the creek volumes are high and the depths are deep. It's not good. Uh, you may have seen videos of people crossing creeks uh, and it looked flat and the rocks were small on the bottom and all that. That's typical of a meadow. Whenever you take water, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's go with it. When you come to a creek crossing, and when we, I start talking about later about assessing um, creeks for safe crossing, typically the trail, the summer trail, doesn't, doesn't care about creek crossings. When they design where the trail is going to cross a creek, they weren't thinking about what was safe for you when it's covered with snow and it's melting like mad. No, they're thinking about horses and burrows and summer hikers and that kind of thing. So you're there really not at the optimal time to be following the trail exactly. What do I mean by that? A lot of people feel that they're lost if they're not right over the trail. They're on 12 feet of snow, but they got up their GPS says, oh man, you're right on this trail. Okay, perfect. If I'm not on the trail, I'm, oh shit, lost. And they don't deviate from the trail. Trails have switchbacks down steep slopes. But when the slope is covered in snow, that is a dangerous slope, especially if you don't have a boot track in it. And we'll get to that in a minute because that is one of the things that's going to make or break your Sierra experience, especially if you get there mid-May while it's still secret season and the snow is frozen. But if you have a boot track in it, you can be in there in your trail hike, your trail runners in your micro spikes because you're walking on a flat when I say flat, it's flat side to side. You may be on a steep slope going across the slope, in other words, traversing that slope, but you're on a, a flat path that's been beaten down in the snow by lots of people going through, and it's called a boot track. It may be post holy It's not going to be smooth. It's going to be lumpy, and it's going to refreeze in May, so it's going to be icy in the morning. So you may start out with your micro spikes, and that's perfectly fine. And then when the surface gets soft, because you're approaching the thaw, then your uh, micro spikes are gonna ball up, you're gonna have that cantaloupe sitting under there and it's gonna frustrate the hell out of you. So you're just gonna decide to take the, the micro spikes off and that's kind of how it goes. But um, where was I with this? Uh, see, what's nice about talking to a live audience is you guys can catch me when I wander off with some great, yeah, Carol's laughing wander off with some great instruction. I get about halfway through it and then I lose my train of thought. So let's get back on to um, the, main, the main points here. Um, what's going to be happening during the thaw? I know where I was going. So once the thaw starts after a normal winter, end of May, uh, it's no longer freezing at night. Uh, the snow will be soft in the morning or relatively, and I'm talking morning by eight o'clock. So you can't be really chilling out and having a breakfast in bed, which I love to do under these conditions, the best way to deal with this, when the snow is post holy, when you first arrive in the Sierra, you're gonna really be getting up at three, getting off by four in the morning to try and utilize whatever hard snow is created overnight, but whatever near freezing conditions there were, so that you have some easy feet swinging on the hard surface conditions so that you can make what miles you can, before it turns to soup around mid morning and you can't go anywhere. So um, that's kind of what happens in that end of May, early start of thaw phase, depending upon when you start it. So now we're really looking at the, the, the uh, uh, entering this year when the thaw starts end of May. So this is what you're gonna see. It's gonna cause as I've already said, but I've got to kind of go down my outline so I don't miss any points. These are very important. You need to know what the thaw will cause. So the snow turns to soup and it only partially hardens overnight, depending upon what those overnight temperatures are. Sun cups develop. We've talked about that. Post holing begins. We've talked about that. Uh, post holing, once again, to define it, is that sudden, unexpected 
plunge your body will do when the surface of the snow can no longer support your body weight and weight of your pack, and you have no idea when it's going to happen. You will find yourself to minimize fear of this sudden elevator down kind of thing. Ah, oh, that didn't do it. I'm oh, sorry. You heard a beep. That was my email. Don't know why. Sorry, Carol. Um, you have these sudden elevator down moments and then these sudden stops. It's always, it's not the transition going down that's, that's scary, except for the fact that sometimes you'll, your head will go back or you're going to hurt your back or you're going to jar your knees or something like that. It's the stop at the bottom, whatever you stop against. But post hauling is not fun. It's, it's unexpected. You can't prepare for it. You don't know what's going to happen. And you're going to find that you're going to walk flat footed to minimize it. And that's where I was going. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in, in a minute. Um, you'll find also that as the snow thaws, it doesn't like just disappear. What it does is it recedes up in elevation. So where you had after a normal winter, you have a snow line on the southern exposures. Southern exposures will, will um, thaw first, but what happens is there's less snow on south facing slopes than north facing slopes. So you're going up, you're looking at Forrester and you're going like, oh my God, there's only like half of it is covered with snow. But when you get on top and you look down the other side, there's snow forever all the way down into Vidette and, and, and center junction, center basin junction and, and all the way, all the way down. So this, there will be more snow on the north sides at, and down to lower elevations than on the south sides. Therefore, you're going to have, and you're going to get a, a little excited because, oh, wow, I don't have my snow line. The snow line is where I got to define these so that you guys know what I'm talking about. The snow line is the lowest elevation at which you bump into snow. It could be covering the trail. It could be spotty next to the trail. But you know, as you're climbing up out of Kennedy Meadows South and you're hitting a launch a pre peak, the trail actually gets to about 10,000 feet. You'll hit snow after a normal winter in May at about or right before Alancha Peak. So you're climbing out of Monachi Meadows, you're heading up Alancha Peak, and that's where you're first gonna find snow and you're gonna kind of like, all right, gotta get used to this because you're entering an entirely different environment. You don't have the traction you had before, you can't see the trail, you don't know where you're going and everything looks the same. So it's a, and the air is cold, it's not conducive, uh, warm, your body wants 98, 0.6 and everything around you is now becoming 40 degrees sub freezing at night it's it's hostile so you're, you're really as i mentioned in recent posts uh, on facebook you've got to get it in your heads that you're going from your idealistic uh pretty trail in southern california with the exception of a few blips of mount san antonio and san Jacinto and and, and maybe some other high places where you might encounter snow uh, you're, you're now you're now in the snow zone and you're going to be in it until you get to Donner, you know, depending upon the winter. And we'll get into all of that. Lastly, uh, let's see the, what, what the thaw causes. Your creek volumes, the more snow, the more snow is in the drainage above you. For example, well, let's just kind of make this a little real. Um, think Mono Creek Crossing or some of the creek crossings in the washboard of northern Yosemite. After you leave Tuolumne Meadows and you go north, you've got a whole bunch of canyons you're going to go in and out of and in and out of. Those canyons, if you take a look at the topo, those canyons from where the trail crosses the creek to the headwaters of the creek is at miles and just tons of acreage of snow up there. When that starts to melt, all that water comes down, all those tributaries and funnels into the thing in front of you, it's going to be a rip roaring white water thing that you do not want to cross. And a lot of people have just said, screw it, and they turn around. To, to follow the creek uphill to find a safer crossing, that works. But when that, you look at your map, you're standing on the side of, say, Matterhorn Creek, and you're thinking, how far do I need to go upstream to find a safe place to cross? because the creek is smaller uh, or is narrower. Maybe uh, it's in a meadow, so it's flatter. I'll, I'll, we'll get into that sort of stuff tomorrow and, and learning how to deal with creek crossings. But you're looking at going miles in snow and, and maybe that's not your thing. And maybe you're exhausted already from being on the snow for three weeks. Now that three weeks doesn't count all your trips to town. So it's three weeks straight through, do the math, 
a mile an hour in May, how many hours of sunlight do you have? Maybe eight, 10, you know, it's still May. So you're gonna figure out, you're not gonna be able to do the twenties or whatever that you were finally up to uh, in Southern California. You're gonna dial back Kennedy Meadows South. You're gonna be adding on food weight. You're gonna add on some gear weight. You're gonna add on some clothing weight. You're strong at this point. Don't sweat the poundage. It's gonna be foreign at first, but don't forget your muscles get stronger. That's why people go to the gym forever. You know, at first you're lifting five pounds and two weeks later you're lifting 10 pounds and so forth. Your muscles are designed to get stronger. So don't worry about that. Just be safe. Um, that's what the thaw does. It's going to affect the creeks. It's going to affect the snow and it's going to affect you. Minorly, when all that water starts melting, the trails filled with water too. Water is coming straight down the, the, the canyon sides in the Sierra. Where are the trails? Going across the canyon down the valley, the, the water coming down the, the walls of the Sierra are gonna hit the trail, fill them with water. Then the, the water is gonna run down the trail and turn it into its own little creek. So you're gonna be splashing through lots of water during the thaw. So when you hear these stories about people having uh, chronically wet feet, which isn't necessary. I have never in my 40 years of teaching snow travel safety in the Sierra had wet feet. But then I use other methods that people nowadays seem to not want to do. But we'll get into all of that tomorrow because that's all part of the solution to, the, to, to these things. What we're, what we're discuss, discussing right now are the hazards that are caused by the time frame that you're, walk, that you're dealing with when you leave in April, beginning of April, middle of April, end of April. And what you're going to see in the Sierra, Northern California, Oregon, Washington. All right. Now, here's the duration thing. So we just caught, we just talked about the causes, what the thaw causes. Now we're going to talk about the duration of the thaw. If you have a drought winter preceding you, factor about a four-week thaw. Historically, that's about what it's been for the nasty creek crossings to subside, and you don't have to hunt around forever to find a safe place to cross. You're talking about a four-week period from whenever the thaw started. Now, after a drought winter, the thaw may start early. Now, this is actually a really good thing. So this would be one of the pros, and we'll touch on it later. The thaw may start, instead of the end of May, it may start the beginning of May, in which case that four-week period has already happened by the time you hit Kennedy Meadows South. So now you won't even have bad creeks to deal with after a drought winter. So you guys, clear sailing, but be praying for a drought winter. Now realize you've got millions of people praying against you because they want snow in the Sierra because California needs water. So normal winter, normal winter is about six, eight weeks of high creeks, of, of snow on trail, water on trail. That's why people after a normal winter, your average backpacking season in the Sierra doesn't start till like the 4th of July. So mid-July, and then you're gonna expect snow on the trail anyway, because remember, and I was talking about this, and I think this is what I didn't finish. When snow melts, you're not going to have a 9,500 foot snow line in May. You may have, it'll recede. So by the middle of May, maybe it's going to be at 10,000 feet. By the end of May, it's going to be at 10,5. So if you have a drought winter and the thaw is done, when you look at Forrester, you may see no snow at all. Forrester's 13.2. That's a south-faced ascent. Gets really hot, but expect to see snow on the north side. How far down will that snow be? It may only be 1,000 feet. It may be 1,500 feet. It just depends upon factors that we haven't even gotten to yet, like wind and ambient temperature and whether there's been any rain or snow and stuff like that after the thaw started. So that has to do with the intensity of the thaw, where you will see those snow lines. So, so let's just make sure you get it. After a drought winter, maybe a four week thaw, the, dr the thaw could start a month in advance of normal, normal being the end of May. I know I'm redundant, but I wanna get this picture in your heads because that's why, as I said before, April starts are problematic in their timing regarding the hazards you're gonna see. After a heavy winter, the thaw could run two and a half months. There's a ton of snow up there. 
and it's going to take a while to burn off. So people have gone into the Sierra after a heavy winter, and they've had four, five, six feet of snow on, say, Muir Pass, mm, early September, end of August. It can be bad. So just keep that in mind. Okay, when does the thaw end? And we've kind of talked about it. We've kind of described that the end of the thaw is being when the creeks subside and, and everything becomes a little bit safer to, to cross, you know, at the trail where the summer trail crosses. Caveat teaching moment, keep this in mind. You do not have to cross a creek where the summer trail does. Underlined quotation marks, bold print, italicized. Just because the summer trail crosses there, that doesn't mean you have to cross there. You don't. You can go upstream, downstream, find a safe place to cross. When you get to the other side, just remember where the summer trail is. If you went downstream and you went across, the summer trail is upstream and vice versa. It's not tough to find the trail. Uh, if it's completely buried, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Just figure out which way it's going and go the same way. It doesn't even matter. You don't have to be on. Here's another one. Okay. Another teachable moment. You do not have to be on the trail. And I said this before, so let's just underscore it. You do not have to be on the trail all the time when it's covered in snow. Matter of fact, you do not want to be on the trail in certain places. Like I mentioned before, switchbacks. Switchbacks mean very steep slopes. You do not want to be on those very steep slopes if there's no boot track. And we mentioned before being on the steep slopes when there was a boot track. You can get away with trail runners, micro spikes, but if there is no boot track and the snow is still hard, so you're in there uh, middle of May to the end of May, still secret season time after a normal winter. So you've still got uh, frozen sub freezing temperatures at night and nice, hard, wonderful snow to walk on all day. Last two weeks of May after a normal winter. Um, that oh crap, where was I going with that? Um, geez, I wish you could. <laughs> wish you could say, Carola, where I was going with that. But well, you were talking about alternate river crossings before. I don't know if that's kind of the same. Oh, no, it's, it, it's, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all I need. <laughs> it's getting back to the trail and following a trail. So the, 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 one of the keys, and the reasons why you're going to have a paper topo map and you're going to have your Explorer in reach plus thing that has a big screen that tells you where you are relative to the trail via GPS, because you want to look for those switchbacks up ahead and you want to go, hell no, I don't have a boot track. So I'm dealing with very steep slopes and I'm edging in with the sides of my shoes. I don't want to make it any worse. So you don't want to follow the trail in those areas. You want to follow the creek that kind of goes like over that way. And when you get down to wherever the creek goes, you can backtrack up, catch the trail, whatever. When, the, when snow covers everything, you've got to find the safest routes based on the slope of the snow, not where the trail goes. Trail doesn't care about that. It wasn't built for that. So when the snow is everywhere, you've got to be more of a cross country type hiker where you're picking your route based on your skills. Same is true for when the snow covers everything. All right, so that was in reference to heavy winters and how long the thaw lasts. It can last two and a half months, 10, 12 weeks. No bueno in the Sierra. Um, then we got into um, when the thaw ends, when the creeks mellow, and when the snow disappears. After a heavy winter, the snow is not really going to be disappearing. You're always going to have snow way up high. And where's that? On the passes. What do you have there? Some of the steepest trail conditions and terrain conditions of your entire hike. Is that going to be uh, something to bring you a lot of peace? No, you're going to look down from the chute and forester and you're going to go, holy heck, it's going to be scary because that's probably the only place on the trail that's got to actually 45 degree pitch. I've taken a, I've been there so many times. I would go there maybe eight times in the spring every year. And sometimes I bring a slope meter and measure it. And the chute itself is 45 degrees. The approach slope is about 20 degrees. You're going to think it's really steep and it's going to look like a toboggan run, but it's only about 20 degrees. But anyway, we, we digress again. Um, your post-holing conditions will be nasty during the thaw, 
but they will compact. They will get harder. They'll be knocked down. They'll be stomped down, all that stuff. Once you've got a boot track, it's not so bad. So like if you find yourself in the Sierra in July, what are we doing on time? I'm running out of time. If you find yourself uh, in the Sierra in July, a lot of people have been in there and they're going to want to stay on the trail. They're afraid of, of being off the trail. They think they're going to get lost. So they're just going to pack the snow down. Um, even though it's July, that heavily packed snow doesn't turn to soup. Once again, you're going to be, you guys, April's PCT start, uh, mid-May, June 1st, JMT starters, you're there when there's still a lot of air in the snowpack. It's still con consolidating, but it is getting hard. But you don't have the refreeze happening every night. So yes, uh, if you enter this year really late, uh, it is, it is uh, consolidated. The boot track has caused that. All right, I think I'm gonna skip. I did an overview after this when we were talking about the end of the thaw, but I'm running out of time. And I think I covered all of my main points. Basically, if there's snow, Keep it in your head, it's slippery, it's frozen water. You tip it up on angle and it's, it's gonna encourage you to slip and fall. Falls uh, are often not pretty things. They usually end up head first and they're tumbling events. Uh, in ski patrol, we like to refer to those as yard sails where everything on you flies off and is scattered across the slope and with little old you in a pile at the bottom. Um, so that's where the yard sale expression comes from. Okay, the cons, the, the, the things that are really bad about this time, and a lot of them we've already talked about, environmentally and strategically. So let's hit so environmentally. Southern California can be hot and dry. It's not as nice and cool as, as it was in the March timeframe. When you enter the Sierra, um, you may have a, a snowpack to deal with. Um, you may have a thaw to deal with. So we've talked about post tolling. We've talked about the snow turning to soup by mid morning. We've talked about sun cups turning into you know garbage can holes in the snow. Uh, the creek crossings become torrential and kill people. Um, we'll talk about how to deal with that tomorrow morning. We talked about trench foot and the and the, uh, the way of dealing with these snow conditions by getting up early in the morning and hiking at night. And that's actually not that great because your headlamps only shine so far. And how do you navigate when you can't see way out there to the, the pass? You can't see the ridges. You're, you're, you've got stars. That's not good. Uh, you can't see the different slope angles you're standing on, especially if you're in there during the secret season. So hiking at night, uh, although it's a, solution, it's a solution for dealing with soupy snow, it's not a safe one. Um, regarding uh, you know, navigation. You can't see where you're going. You can't see the different angles of, of snow. And guys, we're getting there. I'm almost done. Um, another con, another bad thing is that in Northern California, now you're gonna get the really hot heat uh, and be very exposed up there. So it's really not good. You're also gonna get a lot of, you're gonna get uh, off the snow. Well, well, that's good. But you're gonna get in a lot more dirt, bugs, bears, mud, pests, snakes, all that kind of junk, whether in Northern California or Southern California, you're gonna have a lot more pests. Some people don't like those, but it's worth mentioning, the later you start, the more of that you'll have. Uh, the, the last environmental point we've already mentioned, so I'm not gonna go into it too much. Just remember, snow can start flying up in the North Cascades by the middle of September. So get across the border by then, always remember that. But you've also got some stuff that happens besides just snowstorms. Washington's known for fog. And when the fog comes in and you're on a pass and the pass still has snow, it turns into a whiteout and you can't tell up from down. Um, and that's not good. And another really bad condition in Washington is freezing rain late in the season. So September 1st on, you're going to notice your ambient daytime temperatures are going to start plunging. And when anything comes in, it turns into like freezing fog, freezing rain, and that just gets you soaked and frozen. And that's not cool. Um, a lot of times it lasts for a while. So you can't say, oh, heck, I'm just going to wait for the sun to come out and I'll dry out. Well, that may work in the Sierra, but it doesn't work so much in, Northern, or in the North Cascades. Strategically, um, one of the bad things or some of the bad things about starting at this time or your time of year, uh, April, 
one, you've decreased your time frame, your hiking window. So you're, you're a little shorter than starting in March it's because there's a fixed ending mid-September. Um, so it, 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 just keep that in mind. Um, strategically, you're, you're Northern California, Southern California, you're gonna have to be carrying some water. Maybe that's not the best thing. There's more pack weight and all that kind of junk. And you're more reliant on the water catches. So strategically, yeah, that may not be as cool as starting a month earlier, which is cooler and better for, uh, you know, more streams are running in Southern California, Northern California. Like I mentioned before, strategically, you're gonna have more pests and more, more problem things by starting later. Uh, it's warmer, all the bugs come out, all the bears come out, all the snakes like hanging out on the trail. So um, you're gonna have those sort of things uh, to deal with. We've already talked about strategically being in the Sierra during the thaw. It is not the right time to be in the Sierra. You guys have to do it because if you're gonna go from Mexico to Canada, you're gonna have to learn how to be a mountaineer and deal with uh, these kind of conditions. It's a foreign environment and it's not exactly friendly to you. So being in the Sierra during the thaw is not good, but we'll talk tomorrow about how to, do, how to deal with that. Um, when you go really late, when you start really late in April and you go through the Sierra a little bit later in this time window, you lose the ability to choose safe routes over the snow because the snow is thinning to the point where you really can't follow the creek anymore because that to do that when there's no snow, it's all bushes and rocks and boulders and logs and stuff. It's not fun. And you could probably see kind of where the trail is because it's only got a foot of snow on it now. And so you're just, you're going to lose the ability to find safe routes. Now you're going to actually have to stay on the trail, even though it's covered with some snow. And when it does the switchbacks, it gets a little scary because it can be slippery and you've got nothing but steep snow and trees going down into all the creeks. Um, so that's what's happening in the Sierra strategically with your time window. Northern California, we've already talked about. Uh, you've got uh, snow on the north sides of things if you're early in your time window of, of the April month. And if you're late in the time window, you could have a hell of a lot of heat up there. Um, resupplying strategically late in the season, some resorts close after Labor Day. So up in Washington, uh, find out when resorts are closing before you get there. And then we talked about the early snow. So that wraps up things. Uh, if you start hearing, uh, getting the feel as you progress past Snoqualmie Pass, that winter's coming in early, the locals are starting to talk about that. It's getting really ambiently cold. You're seeing more sign in the sky of uh, storms going by, maybe still to the north. Uh, you're getting a little afraid that one's going to hit you and bury you. That's the stuff that's going to cause you to worry a little bit and increase your speed. So kind of think that way. You might want to even gear up on some uh, cold uh, weather clothing. Maybe grab your micro spikes, your long underwear, that kind of stuff. Because if you do get snowed on early in the winter, it can trap you and it has done and killed people and caused them to get lost and never be found uh, like Sherpa. Um, so don't become a statistic. Uh, 